Gambia may be one of Africa's smallest countries, but it more than punches above its weight on the international stage. You. How are you? Thank you, sir. Not just because of its president's views on homosexuality or on relations with the West, but because of his ambitious plan called Vision 2016, which aims to make the Gambia self-sufficient in rice by the end of 2015. I'm Henry Bonsu, and this is Face to Face. Mr. President, thank you very much indeed for welcoming us to your country. Now, you're known for moving around in your pristine whites, but today they look very, very brown, uh, indeed full of mud. Can you explain why that is? First of all, I want to welcome you to the Gambia. Uh, the reason why I've changed color is because I've been working on my fields. I believe leadership by example. We've been importing rice for a very long time. And uh, despite the fact that we have so many hospitals and a lot of qualified doctors in the system, uh, people are dying like flies. We have various strange diseases that can only be attributed to what we eat. So in order to address that issue, we have to grow what we eat and eat what we grow. But Mr. President, in order to scale up, it's going to involve a change of so many different things, not least culture, machinery, output. How on earth are you going to do that? Well, it is a very simple matter. Uh, all we need is just small machinery. And then, of course, uh, the only time we need uh, machinery will be harvesting because you can see that uh, if we didn't have the number of people that are here, we still have, we'll suffer post-harvest losses. But what is more important is the determination and the political will to do so. If the, now the people are ready to do so because they now know it's possible. And they've seen me as the president walking there. Leadership, because if I talk and I didn't do anything, they'll say, oh, he's just sitting in the office and talking. So you're talking about leadership by example? Leadership by example. But to scale up from Gambia producing 15% of what it consumes in terms of rice to 100% by 2016, yes. that's a fantastic ambition. How on earth can you manage to turn around the current situation? in such a short time? Well, uh, the fields you are going, you've seen so far, this is just less than 25% of the fields that have grown, cultivated from May this year up to now. And so what we, what we have produced now, this year, is about 10% of the import. Uh, most of the imported rice in this country, 60% uh, of that is re-exported. So what we actually consume is about between 16 to 20,000 tons per annum. So the rest is re-exported. So to turn that around, if my objective is to, before 20, uh, by 2015, I would have had about uh, 90,000 hectares under cultivation. 90,000 hectares, let's say the lowest uh, uh, scenario would be five tons per hectare. That is more than what we need to feed this country. So we are going to, by the grace of the Almighty Allah, by 2016, I'm not allowing one grain of rice to be imported to this country. And I mean it, and I'm going to achieve that. Driving over here from Banjul, I saw plenty of land, green fields, arable land, but it didn't appear that much activity was going on on that land. That alarming. Mr. President, what's going on in those fields? Because they have already finished the harvesting of granules. Now, the only fields you go to and find activity going on would be millet and kuz farms and of course uh, 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 rice fields. But they have harvested, if you've looked at it, you have seen that they're st stuck in their granules for tracing in order to winnow and sell. So there's a lot of activity going on. Also, these farmers, uh, they don't farm all the fields every year. They leave some fields to follow so some, and also other fields are left for cattle grazing and other ruminants. So uh, don't judge by the lack of activity that we've seen in certain areas because uh, now, okay, another thing also, I'm not, my agriculture is based on organic. We don't allow chemical fertilizers here. And no GMO, genetically no, modified organisms. No, we are organism. not going to do that because it's more hazardous. It's taking poison. We are not going to allow GMO when we can grow organic and feed ourselves. What about improving that value chain from the person in the field, the person processing, the person 
the middleman or woman, and then finally the person who wants to export. How does one improve those links in the chains so that one can see a real commercial business in the Gambia as you see in India and Thailand, which end up exporting right here into the Gambia? Yes, uh, when you look at Vision 2016, we're not talking only about production, we're talking about processing. Because without processing, uh, the farmers become discouraged because like these farmers, if you tell them to grow watermelon next year, they're going to say, oh, the last year melon, nobody bought it. And nobody's buying it because the, the market is flooded. But if that was agro-processing, we could have processed it into something else. So agro-processing is an integral part of, of Vision 2016. We don't want to export rice, raw rice or whatever, unprocessed rice. Whatever we, exp we produce locally will be value added. We're going to process. So we're going to spend almost, uh, by the grace of the Almighty Allah, about $200 million in agro-processing and mechanizing ag agriculture, but basically in agro-processing because also mangoes, we have a problem. We import, uh, import a mango juice because more than a ton of fresh mangoes in this country. And that mango juice, if you look at it, is just made of mango flavor, but it's 90% water. I get the impression that this isn't just about healthcare, it isn't just about nourishment, it's also political for you. If so, explain how. Uh, Semi-political because the West is using food, as, food aid as a weapon as well. And of course also for your independence. Uh, with the flooding, weather change in, in the major rice producing countries, uh, if you cannot feed yourself, you cannot be independent. We are the ones who are advocating for 100% independence in whatever we do. And so for us to achieve that, we must eat what we grow and grow what we eat. There is also a, the health dimension of it. What we eat, if we know how it is grown, then we'll be able to control our health. Because without a healthy nation, Gambia can never be a prosperous nation. And how do we assure a healthy nation when we eat something that is grown outside and we don't even know how it is grown and grown mainly for export? But Mr. President, there are lots of international organisations that are aid and donors and partners with your own country. You point your finger at them, but they would say, look, we're helping the Gambian people. Why would you attack us? Where did they help us? They would say that they are giving food aid, they would say that they're giving budgetary support, a whole range of things that the IMF, the World Bank, the EU would say they want to partner with you in. They're not, they're not helping me. If the West reform to Africa, what they have looted for the past 400 years, plus 25 interest, they're not giving us any aid. They're giving us back what, something that is infinitesimal compared to what they have taken from us. So they're not giving me any aid, they're not giving me any, any, any favours. They don't give me back what they've for, taken for 400 years and see whether I'll ask them for anything. So they're not giving me aid. In fact, that's even an insult. If you take a bull and then give me only the horns and you tell me you're helping me, that's an insult. Is that one of the reasons why you like to point the finger at the West so much? Because deep down you think they haven't repaired and recompensed Africa for what they've taken out over all these years? No, uh, that's not the reason. The reason is that the West has only been ungrateful. They, they were, abject poverty drove Europeans to Africa and they exploited us for 400 years. In those years, there has never been any election. There were no parliamentary systems. To, after 400 years of looting Africa, they turn around. Some of us have to take up arms and kick them out. Now they come around and give us lectures about democracy and human rights. When in their own country there's no democracy. Where's the democracy for blacks in the UK or blacks anywhere in Europe? Now, the, the, the so-called skinheads or neo-Nazi or the far right, if they were in Africa or, or in, in, uh, in the Gulf State, they'd be called terrorist organizations. And why are they not being called terrorist organizations and be dealt with? And they express the same hatred that uh, extremists also expose towards humanity. They all, they all, and both, be it Islam, they call, those who call themselves Islamic extremists or those neo-Nazis and skinheads, they are all anti-human, they hate humanity. So why are those in the third world called terrorists and being bombed, and those in the West, the KKK in the United States of America, are called far-right and uh, uh, white supremacists? Supremacy who, against who? 
So I'm not anti West, I'm anti the hypocrisy and their racism. Your critics and critics of today's African leaders would say that most countries now have reached their golden jubilee. Your own country celebrates 50 years of independence in 2015, and they would say the fault is with you post-independence leaders because you have been in control for five decades. What would you say to that? The British have been here for 400 years. They never taught us democracy. We never had one Gambian be a member of the British parliament or the colonial parliament. And that's why up to today, Gambia, I have to build a national assembly. The first time in the history of this country that the national assembly is being built. The British never built a high school in this country in 400 years. So what, are they, what is there for them to teach me? They came to my country. There's a place around the Atlantic coast where 5 o'clock, 5 p.m., if you go there, they arrest you and lock you up a black man in our own country. So more than 1,000 years up to now, the West has never been democratic. And up to today, they are not democratic because if democracy is anything to go by, you have to respect the will of the people. Who do they think they are that they have to teach Africans how to be democratic when we have never colonized anybody? So this issue of Western democracy is a fallacy. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. How many blacks are killed in the UK and no investigation is, is done? If a black man is accused of uh, killing a white man in the 24 hours, he'll appear in a court of law. Typical example. When the people rose up against the system because of pro police brutality in London, David Cameron called them gangsters and whatever. But when, and you can see the reaction, but when a, a, a black, two black men killed a, a soldier, they were asking for the death penalty. Can you see the difference? A black man shooting a white man would be arrested in 24 hours in the UK. But a white man killing scores of blacks will never be arrested in the history, in, in the next 25 years. Where is the justice? Let them, before you point finger at me, look at yourself first. If you live in a glass house, don't throw stones. After all, they came to Africa.